We usually start with the pledge to the flag, so if you're able, will you rise and join me, please? No, no, you don't. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I want to say hello again and welcome. I'm Linda Call, and we're glad to see all of you here tonight. Um, I want to say a special welcome to our speaker, Julian Adams, and uh, anyone else who's here who hasn't been here before, we want to say welcome. Um, <clears throat> the weather seems to have been getting a little bit better. Things are looking greener out there. I was talking to somebody just a couple of weeks ago, and they said, you know, it has to snow at least twice on the daffodils before it's truly spring. And I think that really did happen this year. But the daffodils are up and they're looking bright and very springy and festive. Um, the other story I like to tell, and if you've been here before, you've heard my story about the spirea. Now, ladies of yesteryear used to always plan their housekeeping in the springtime so that they had it all done by the time the spirea was in bloom. That didn't mean that they just vacuumed through the house really quickly. It meant that they cleaned, cleaned the stove pipe, they washed all the windows inside and out, took down the curtains first, they cleaned the china cabinet and refreshed all the dishes inside, and washed all the woodwork, which it's been a long time in my house since I've washed the woodwork. But <laughs> they did all this before the spirea bloomed, and that was on their calendar because that's about the time that uh, the lilacs were coming out too and it wouldn't be very long before it was time to plant the garden. That would have been in the, uh, the end of May. And speaking of the, about May, here we have National Preservation Month for the whole month of May. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're going to be talking about tonight is preservation in our community. Um, because this is our annual meeting, I would like to call upon our secretary to read the minutes of last year's annual meeting. Uh, Wednesday, April 25th, 2018, the meeting was opened by President Grace Lehman with a request to stand for the pledge to the flag at 704. The minutes of the 28th, March 28th meeting were read by Secretary Phil Farrelly with a motion to accept as read by Cheryl White and a second by Amy Swanson. Uh, as President Lehman explained, the term limits of the board members are about to be elected. Cheryl White was nominated by Sue Briggs and Julie Sharline was nominated by Bonnie Kinney. The Alice were marked and Carol Brooms was re-elected to the board. Mary Alice Panic and Linda Call were all, were all elected to three-year terms to end in 2021. The two-year terms will be held by Cheryl White and Judy Sherrilyn to end in 2020. Uh, they filled the terms of Jeffrey Donahue and Doreen Roth, who had uh, advised the board of their resignation. Um, President Lehman explained the, about the, the taste of Stafford and what, uh, what are the plans for the theme, and that the format will be different than other years, much planning yet to be discussed by the board, board of, and the committee. President Lehman also explained that the scholarship application uh, will be going out, and the note, uh, the note was that it was mailed a week ago. We will be buying refreshments due to the problem with the health department needing to permit, needing a permit for the food, uh, food served that is homemade. A request was made for those who have not paid their dues to see Treasurer Virginia Rigoni. Uh, the meeting was adjourned at 7.20 p.m. with motion from Cheryl White and a second from Amy Swanson. Okay. Is there a motion to accept those minutes? Uh, Cheryl White and a second to the motion? I'll wait. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you very much. Um, our board tonight is electing four new trustees. And before we do that, we would like to say thank you to the outgoing people that have served. 
Phyllis Darling has been our secretary and our vice president for before the bylaws were made, so that she's been here for about 10 years, and that was legal because we didn't have those bylaws. So she's outgoing, and our bylaws say that you have to be off the board a year before you can come back again. So we'll be looking to see Phyllis again. Yes. We hope. <laughs> Another person yeah. going off the board is uh, Grace Lenin, and we thank you, Grace, for the three years that you've served and the skills and the good, uh, all the good things that you've done while you were serving on the board. Also, we want to say thank you to Virginia Ragoni, who is our perpetual, uh, what's that other word I want? It's about a flowery word, Susan, help me. Per, uh, perennial? Perennial. She's our perennial treasure. She has been ever since, well, almost since Adam was here. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I know I'm getting old, but I'm not quite that old. I'm not quite that old, but she has been our successful. I know, I don't remember. I would really better give her a hand. Yeah, thank you very much. We also want to thank in, um, I don't know what my word is, but the late Bonnie Kinney, who served, and we are going to fill her position because she passed away last year before she was able to finish her three-year term. So at this point, I would like to call upon uh, Andy Darling, who's our nominating committee, to refresh us as to whom he told us last month would be our uh, slate of Trustee officers, trustee board members. I am not on the board of trustees, but I am the uh, perennial nominating committee for making sure that we have enough people on the board of trustees. That's right. There's supposed to be nine uh, with three-year terms, so that you have three coming up for election every year. Uh, <laughs> so usually there would be three people to. Uh, to vote for this year, however, as she said, we have a fourth vacancy for Bonnie Kenny as she's passed. We have managed to figure, find three people to fill four <coughs> vacancies. And to be specific, I think Grace Lehman was willing to fill out the one year of Bonnie Kenny. Yes. And uh, Jenny has been drafted to do another three years. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. That leaves two three-year terms uh, and Sue Briggs offered to do one of them. Do we have any nominations? I have heard a rumor that there might be somebody willing. Is there? So the nominations are open for uh, a one three-year term for the Board of Trustees. I want to nominate Colleen O'Connor. Colleen O'Connor. I'll give you a little word about Colleen O'Connor. It's the Reverend Colleen O'Connor. She's the uh, priest at St. Paul's Episcopal Church and also St. Mark's Episcopal Church in Leroy. She just um, spoke to us this afternoon and said that she would be willing to serve on our board. So um, she will be our uh, one nomination. And we would call again out to you for the second time. Are there any other nominations? And I think Robert's rules are not positive, but we call for the third time. Are there any other nominations? <coughs> Hearing no others, we will close the nominations. And I would ask you uh, for a motion to accept these four people as uh, new <coughs> trustees on our board. So moved. Uh, moved by Donna Wanke and seconded by Cheryl White. All in favor? Aye. 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 And thank you very much. We'd be glad to welcome these people to help us continue on with our work at the Historical Society. Say a little bit about Sue Briggs. I should have said it before, but she's the, she's the uh, chairman of the museum committee. She's been on our board before. She's a past teacher and uh, a, a native of Stafford. Grace Lenin was a teacher at Leroy Central for 30-some years as a home economist down there in Leroy Central School. 
she lives in Mormonville, and she's been an asset to our committee as well. And like I said, we couldn't keep our money straight without Virginia. Thank you. This concludes our business meeting, and I would call for a motion to close our meeting. Motion? Motion to close. <coughs> okay. She moves in a second, please. Cheryl White, she stood up a second. We'll call upon her again. <laughs> All in favor of closing our, me our meeting. Aye. Thank you so much. Um, we have other great programs that we have scheduled for the coming months as we meet on the fourth Wednesday of the month, seven o'clock, always here in this room. And I'm at a loss right now as to tell you who they are. But one of them is going to be, and I think it's next month, we're going to have a man from uh, Soils and Water in Genesee County, and he's going to talk about the soils here in Stafford. And, and how they have affected the way Stafford has been known all these years as an agricultural community. Our other programs will include the Taste of Stafford in July and um, well, a, a walking tour, yes, we're going to have a walking tour in May, May, 19th. I, May 19th. It's going to start right here at the park and Cynthia Houck is going to take us around the town probably only as far as we can walk. Just a little bit past the park this way and past the fire hall this way, but she's just so excellent in telling about not only that's a pretty house, but she talks about the foundation and the outbuildings and the arched windows and the door fronts and the reasons why people um, might have made their house look that way back in the day and we still have these wonderful houses now. And she won't just talk about the more beautiful houses, she'll talk about the mid-century houses that I still call the new houses because they were new when I was a kid. <laughs> we want to say welcome to you too, Cynthia Howe. She's uh, from the Rochester Landmark Society. She's been with us all afternoon as has Julian and they gave us a wonderful talk this afternoon. They've just had their dinner at the Red Osier, but as wonderful as it is, it's slow, and they're just getting done with their dining and not quite finished. And Julian came without his uh, meal or his dessert. I'd like to invite Sandy to come and introduce our speaker for us tonight. And thank you again for coming. I think you're going to enjoy this meeting. <coughs> so I think I should just read Cynthia before I read. I, where's Julian? Right. Julian, you know what? I'm going to read Dr. Eula's opening for you if I do that. So uh, I first would like to read Cynthia. Okay. Oh, yeah, I'm going to have a couple of pictures if you don't mind. <coughs> Use this for propaganda. <laughs> Show them. How busy Stafford is. Well, while she's taking the pictures, I'll just read this. Uh, <coughs> Cynthia, we're pleased to welcome Cynthia uh, Houck this, this, this afternoon, so this is now. Cynthia is an architectural <coughs> research coordinator for the Landmark Society of Western New York and Rochester. Uh, this is a dry sounding title for someone so engaging in uh, presenting her extraordinary knowledge of area history and architecture. She knows how to tell a story, all while weaving her tale, a history lesson, about a property's significance uh, for today. And Ms. Hawk is a celebrity within the world of Western New York architecture. And who else do we have here that doesn't want to be introduced? <laughs> uh, from the house of Columbus in Batavia, this young man is uh, Ryan Duffy. He's the executive director of Holland Land Office. <coughs> and we're happy to have him come back the second time today. This is wonderful. And if you don't uh, often go to the Holland Land Office, I think Ryan would be very happy to see you. So, uh, I didn't introduce Julian uh, this afternoon. 
Dr. Eula, of course, the Genesee County historian, introduced me. So he gave me his introduction. It's quite lovely. So uh, I'm pleased to welcome, on behalf of Genesee County and the Historical Society of Stafford, the director of the State Community Services for Historic Preservation in New York State, Julian Adams. His office plays a crucial role in the cultivation of public awareness of historic preservation. This has the effect of instilling pride in New York's rich and long history, along with the not inconsequential encouragement of tourism and community revitalization. In our community's icon, our local architecture, we encounter not only what came before us to help make us what we are today, but also what we encounter makes us American. Indeed, in our public spaces, we interact with what makes us human. Americans, in general, have never fully embraced the history as something simply relegated to books containing dates and timelines. We're a practical people. Hence, our understanding of the past is more times than not what we can see and what we can touch. Public buildings that predate us capture this impulse. Our public buildings function as an autobiography of who we are, both in our community and, our, and in America at large. They induce us to remember and also to forget. These buildings evoke our deepest passions and also work to induce us to repress what we don't especially like about ourselves. That is the point. We have to be very careful about what we preserve and equally careful about what we choose not to preserve. If you'll pardon the reference, we may not want to consider what philosopher Nietzsche uh, once said, become what you are. Our community icons help us to know what we are now by altering our awareness of the past. Therefore, in this, in what I'm sure will be a fascinating presentation, I've already seen it, so I know it is. <laughs> You're excused. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> And without further ado, please join us in welcoming a leading figure in the discussion of what's worth preserving, Julian Adams. <laughs> Blooming of spirea means you're supposed to clean your house. I've never planted that spirea. I'll do it when I want to. <laughs> now I want to plant dust. Now I'm going to use this. Are we on? Andy. Andy. Andy, where are you? It is. It's off. I can do this. That's simple. Is that better? Can you hear me? Okay, good. Um, so a few of you have heard this already today, but you know I'll try not to repeat myself entirely. We're talking earlier that um, I don't use a script. I say sometimes the same thing, sometimes not. I may be inspired to see things else tonight. Or I've learned a lot today. I've seen a lot. We had the conversations at dinner about things. And so I may pat it with a little more local color here and there. Now, how many of you may have heard of the New York State Historic Preservation Office? That's why I come out and talk. Uh, NYSHPO, we'll talk about those letters mean in a moment. We are an official branch of state government. We're not the historical society, we're not a, a landmarks organization. Those are important allies for us in the field, people on the front lines. But we are a state agency, we're actually quasi-federal, we take partial federal money and part state money and manage all state and federal preservation programs in New York State. We'll talk about a little bit how that, what that means and the programs we run as we go through the presentation. I manage the Bureau of Community Preservation Services, which is a name we just made up because we couldn't figure out what else to call it. It manages seven state and federal preservation programs across New York State, and some of them we'll talk about. Let me see if I can get this to work tonight. Is that work for me? Nope. I'll do it again. Batteries are Um I always like to start with a little introduction to historic preservation because people know about it. Maybe you know if this building's in the National Register of Places, this is an historic district, people call themselves an historic town or an historic this or historic building. And historic preservation has a long history in America and most people don't know how long history it has. People say, okay, maybe when urban renewal hit, people started caring about old buildings, which it was a very key moment in American history, historic preservation in our country. 
Hello. Um, also, people think about, you know, these back to the city movements that started in the 70s and forward. You know, people rehabbing old buildings, old houses, old commercial buildings. That was another landmark moment in historic preservation. But really, historic preservation and the concern of our history as embodied in buildings goes back to some of the earliest years of our republic, back to Independence Hall in Philadelphia. Uh, most people know what this was. It was the seat of colonial government for uh, Pennsylvania uh, under the crown before the revolution. It was one of the most ornate, largest governmental buildings in the colonies. So it was only the right place to meet for a lot of our founding fathers to get together to talk about the Declaration and the Constitution. So much happened in this building that resonates down to us today and will hopefully keep resonating for decades and centuries to come. So we think of this building, and I used this earlier with the minister, or the Holy of Holies of American Preservation, which it really is, American buildings. But this building, the 1815, was threatened with demolition because Philadelphia was a booming, booming city, development was happening, and the land it sat on was more valuable than the building. America has never changed one whit, one day. So they were going to tear it down probably and put up warehouses or businesses or new development, new homes coming soon. You see those signs here and there. That was going to happen at this site. In 1815, a group of citizens said, this building and what happened there, what it represents is more important than the land it sits on and more valuable than the land it sits on. They petitioned the city in 1815. The city of Philadelphia bought that building expressly for preservation. Um, from going from a rundown building that was proposed for demolition, by the time of the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln visited that building during the Civil War to remind himself and the country of the importance of the pact that was created in that building. So 40, 50 years later, it was recognized as an American landmark. And today, we cannot ever consider it being demolished. But there it is today. The next time we have historic preservation in America that really means something, particularly in New York State, is also basically the Revolutionary War. There's a trend going in early historic preservation dealing with the founding of the country. Now, this is a Hasbro farmhouse, a little stone farmhouse right on the river, the Hudson River in Newburgh, New York. After Cornwallis surrendered uh, Yorktown, there wasn't the end of the war. There was the end of immediate hostilities then, but they had to go back and figure out was a truce going to be signed or a peace going to be signed. So he brought his uh, entire army up and put them in New Windsor nearby, New Windsor Cantonment, which is a state historic site. You should go. There's a Purple Heart Hall of Honor there because this site was where the first Purple Hearts were given to soldiers. So there's a Purple Heart Hall of Honor. He made his headquarters here in the Hasbrook House. There wasn't a lot else in Newburgh at the time, sitting around the river. It's where he penned his farewell address. It's where he created the Order of Cincinnati for the, his officers to carry forward the ideals of the revolution. Um, and as I said earlier today, it's one of the few places we actually know he slept. We know he slept there. He stayed there the entire uh, winter after, after Yorktown before he figured we don't have to go to war again. So, very important. Newburgh sits on an important bay in Hudson River. Hudson River, if you know, is not really a river. It's like an American fjord. It's an estuary of the Atlantic. It's tidal, 140 miles up. All the way to Troy, it's still tidal. So it's... Ships come up, ships have always come up the Hudson, and you get up past uh, to Newburgh, and it opens up this wide expanse of water. Great place for a port. So Newburgh became a very important river port, known as the Queen City of the Hudson. So it started developing, and merchandising, and travel, and a great place to send stuff down the river or up the river. And this was sitting right in the way of the downtown expansion and development. Okay? It was probably going to go down for businesses, probably warehouses and docks on the river, because it was just around the river. <coughs> in 1850, New York State purchased it expressly for its preservation. So the first time a state did that. So I said, we can claim that in New York State. Well, the first time a state said that building is too important to lose, they purchased it. Now, keeping with the George Washington theme, the next time we bump into something is Mount Vernon. George Washington's home is always a great thing with Washington. Always wanted to go home to Mount Vernon and never got to go there very often. He was always serving his country. This was the seat of his life, the seat of his family, his actually family home. His brother built it originally. Um, and I always like to point out that it looks like a grand house. It's really an overgrown farmhouse. <coughs> if you look here, this is narrow, that's wide. Because it started here, one and a half story house. It got bumped up a bit, came a little this way, and Washington, pretty long into his life, added this piece and that piece, probably stepped back and said, oops, that doesn't line up. He stuck the pediment here and the cupola to make you think it's symmetrical when it's really not. Hmm. And if you go in there, it's got maybe one or two grand rooms. The rest of them are really nicely appointed rooms, but they're what? Little farmhouse rooms. Because this was a farmhouse rooms. There's a farmhouse buried in there somewhere. 
Well, Washington, of course, passes on. His family doesn't want the building. In 1859, not in great condition. I mean, that's actually not an optical illusion. That porch is waving at us, and the posts are holding it up. This would be meant real estate booklet as needs tender loving care, or great picture upper, more, rea more reality. The reality would have been a real estate book saying great development potential. Because Washington, D.C. was expanding, and people were beginning on trains, and roads were getting better, and you could go out and have your country home. This sits right on the river, beautiful views of the Potomac. It would have been a great site for like four or five villas for people outside of Washington, D.C. It was offered to the state of Virginia, they had any part of it. It was offered to the federal government, they didn't have any part of it. Lady Ann Pima Cunningham stepped forward and said, I can do this. And she formed the Ladies Matt Burner Association that raised the money to buy it, save it, and begin restoration. They own it and run it to this day. They basically said, y'all had your chance, don't worry about it anymore. They really work hard at restoring it, making sure it's relevant historically, uh, the interpretation, museums. Um, they even re up started and uh, rebuilt his original rye distillery in Selma Burn and Rhino. They don't miss a step. They get it all there. They do a very good job of them for it. So what we're looking at here is what I call the great man theory of history. And that's where preservation started, the big guys. You know, Washington, uh, Jefferson, Franklin, all those people were acknowledged as heroes of America. Now, what we're looking at with Mount Vernon is also a fascination that all those people were gone. Even the guy who was the youngest drummer boy in the Revolutionary War by 1850 was an old man or probably dead. So there was nobody around who knew the general, who shook Lafayette's hand, who was there when Cornwallis surrendered. So they were looking at the buildings as reminders. That's all they had left for where these people lived, where these people acted. So they were looking to preserve those things. There's one here, and one there, and one here, and one there. That changes in the early 20th century. And the most important example we have in America is Williamsburg, Virginia. Miss Williamsburg? Good. I like this crowd. Good travel. <clears throat> Williamsburg was a colonial uh, seat of government for Virginia. It was where the royal governor said. This was the governor's palace. Thomas Jefferson lived there when he was Virginia's royal governor. People don't really realize that. It's where Washington went to the House of Burgesses as representative of its area. It's where Patrick Henry gave his great speeches, you know, give me liberty, give me death, all those kind of things, happened in Williamstown. It was a hotbed of revolution. But after the revolution, the capital was up the river, James River to Richmond, and Williamsburg just kind of settles down. It's a quiet, quiet backwater. Now, quiet can be good. It can be a, be a pretty good preservation tool when not a lot of development's going on, a lot of things are going on. Well, the rector of the Bruton Parish Church, a big Episcopalian Anglican church there, a nice big 18th century church, was stationed there and said, something that's interesting here, this is basically, Williamsburg has been preserved. Somebody dropped a glass bowl over it. He said, this is too important to lose. So he contacted his buddy named John D. Rockefeller and said, come here, I want to show you something. They walked up and down the street, and Rockefeller said, this is important here, we can't lose this. So they started quietly buying up pieces of land until they had the entire historic village court. That's how historic Williamsburg Village was created by the beneficiary of the uh, Rockefellers, the money of the Rockefeller money. It was also one of the most important examples in America. We stopped going this house, that building, this building, and said, wait a minute, there's a story to tell here in all these buildings. Kind of the concept, the early concept we call the historic district, okay? Now, that starts other things. There are historic um, museum villages all over the United States. There's Genesee Country Village up the street here. We have things like Old Beth Page Restoration on Long Island. We have Sturbridge Village in Massachusetts, Deerfield in Massachusetts. And it's all across the country like that, these little museum villages. Now, they're great. You can go there and you can watch people work on an anvil in a blacksmith shop, or you can watch them drill with their buskets on the village green, but you can't live there. Now, it's a nice place to go visit, but there's no way to live there. People started looking around and thinking, well, how do we do this here, where we are? And the first example in America happens in Charleston, South Carolina. Now, Charleston, of course, very, very, very wealthy port city on the East Coast, way back, founded in the 1600s. Amazing architecture, a very special kind of architecture called a single house, where it's turned sideways on the lot, they're not like that house, house, house. It's house, garden, house, garden, house, garden. All one room deep with the big porches. They're called piazzas. They're working the garden. Because it's hot there. And you need to make sure a breeze goes all the way through town, all the way through your house, all the way out the other side of town. 
And this does that. This allows those breezes to catch those breezes off the ocean so you can at least be bearable and tolerable there in some places. A very, very special kind of architecture in America. Charleston um, built grandly, amazing grandly. If you haven't been there, go. The houses are amazing. Um, architecture, the furnishings, the decorative arts are amazing. They were very, very wealthy. Well, they also kind of started something called like the Civil War there, they fired in Fort Sumter. They wound up on the losing end. And they kind of like Williamsburg kind of went to sleep for a while. They started picking back up in the early 20th century, right at the same time something else happened called the car. Now, I gave this quiz last time, everybody got it. What do cars need? Yes. Cars need gas. Cars need? Mm. Well, they need parking. Okay? They have two things that a carriage didn't need. They need gas and they need parking. Okay? Where are you going to put them? How are you going to gas them up? Well, Charleston, cars started showing up, and three houses, three major historic houses, were demolished for a gas station. Now, oddly enough, the people who did that knew what they were up to, and they took all the pretty pieces of the houses and stuck them in the gas station. Prettiest little gas station you ever saw. But three major houses have gone down, and people in Charleston are very house proud. They're a part of the community. And they said, how could this happen? And the city father said, well, we gave a permit. They filled out the paperwork. Yeah, but those houses were important. They filled out the paperwork. So they said, we'll get back to you on that. In 1930, they put together the first historic preservation ordinance in America. And the historic preservation ordinance is a local law. It's enacted at the local law by the local municipal government that embodies a board of people, concerned, expert, educated people in the field, to say, what is important to our community? Is there an area? Is there a building? Is there some landscape? And designate that as historic and say, anything that happens in this area outside of normal maintenance and repair, you have to talk to us about. It doesn't stop things, it guides them. It guides the development, guides what happens in those buildings to make sure that these buildings that we share as a community, we don't lose them. Oh, there that goes. Well, that was Brook Preservation Week, sorry. <laughs> okay, it happens. That's what happened to those buildings in Charleston. Like, exactly that. Um, it makes sure that as a community, we work together to make sure our common shared community, our common heritage, even our common landscape does not happen without our input or control. It doesn't take away your private property rights. It does, it's like anything else. I always tell people, you can't build your house on a ball, but you can't dump your sewage in the front yard, you can't use, lose your, live, your, leave your semi running in the front yard all night long. You can't, you can't do certain things with that building permit, this is another extension of that. You talk about, okay, what is the best for the community of this project? This happens again in New Orleans, wonderful American city, very, very unique, for parking. The French Quarter, historic built-up area, amazingly tight built-up area, had amazing historic buildings, a major building, the French-speaking opera house, was torn down for a parking lot. Because people in the French Quarter were getting cars and they went somewhere to park them. And again, even by the 1920s and 30s, people knew the French Quarter was very unique and very special. So how could this happen? And the city father said, well, they got the, they got the permit. Need a parking lot? Follow the permit, got a parking lot. And the people of New Orleans said, we can't, with this keeps happening, we'll have building, parking lot, building, parking lot, building, parking lot, we won't have any French Quarter left. They put the second ordinance in place in 1937 that said, this is special to our character as a city. We want to protect this and guide development in this area. Again, they put the ordinance in place, they put the community members in place, and those two commissions, Charleston and Savannah, are still in action today. They've expanded their purview, they've ad added other areas to their historic preservation districts. So when you go to those cities, they're celebrated for their history, they're celebrated for architecture. People go spend money to walk the streets and stay in hotels and eat in the restaurants. That was not by accident, and it was not by the goodwill of the building owners. It was the community stepped forward and said, this is important to us, and we're going to have to act as a unit together on this. That's the only reason those things are there. Not by accident. Okay? And again, what happens here, you can eat here. You can sleep here. You can buy clothes. You can get your car, you can get your clothes right clean. You can order pizza. That's what happens. These places become protected and guided in their future development so we don't lose them as a community. At the same time, we can live there and use them. Now, this is an interesting thing here. That whole idea of having local ordinance, by 1965, there only 51 communities have done that. Not a great growth from 30 to 65. We had like Santa Fe, 
San Francisco, New York. Remember New York, how about that one in the second stop. We had um, San Antonio, of course, New Orleans, we had Savannah. These cities you kind of expect where this history is, they were the early adopters. Other cities in America had great architecture and great downtowns and great neighborhoods, but they didn't have the foresight to protect it. That's why we celebrate those communities so much today, because they went back as far as 1930 and said, this is important to us. We're going to look after this as a community. So now we have, actually, I can't keep up with the numbers. They're always spinning up. We have between 2,500 and 3,000 communities in the United States who have preservation ordinances. Now, what made that big leap? We made this huge leap from 65 to today. Well, a lot of it goes back to this issue here. A lot of things happened in America that kind of spurred the historic preservation movement. Some people know about urban renewal. Uh, downtown Rochester, downtown Syracuse, downtown Buffalo. The old adage, if you build it, they will come. The urban renewal motto is, we tear it down, they will come. People didn't come. It didn't happen. I'm sorry. This is, I'm trying to find a happy spot, but I tend to move around. I'll stay right here. I see you wincing. I'll stay right here. I promise. If I move, slap me. Okay. <laughs> so, if somebody walks in and sees you do that, they're going to wonder what happened. <laughs> so, um, also, interstate highway system after World War II, we developed the interstate highway system primarily as a defense network. Not as a transportation network. Eisenhower in Germany saw the, uh, the efficiency of the autobahns moving troops all over Europe and in Germany. He said, we need that here. That's why it's called the Eisenhower, Eisenhower Interstate System. But also, we ripped our cities to shreds with interstate overpasses and clover leaves. What for? So you could get out of the towns quicker. And boy, people did. We ripped our neighborhoods in half. We tore down our downtown towns. All the interest of getting somewhere three to five minutes faster. Those two things really had a huge impact on preservation. The straw that possibly broke the camel's back was this building here, Penn Station in New York City. Built in 1910 on four midtown city blocks, one of the largest and grandest train stations ever built in the world. Designed by the Kim Mead and White, the architects of the Gilded Age America. Built out of Italian marble. Amazing, amazing structure. I'm going to pop forward here a second. This one. This was how you walked in. You know, just a small little place. Everything was grand about this structure, every bit. However, what happens after World War II to trains? Nobody takes them anymore. Interstates, air travel. What you have is a lack of train travel. So they said, you know what? We're not making any money out of this anymore. Let's just tear it down. We'll build something. Well, people went crazy. They were like, you can't tear down Penn Station. It's part of New York. It's only been there 50 years. What do you mean we're going to tear it down? It's marble and steel. And we're going to tear it down. Why? We're going to make some more money out of this. People came out of work. There were protests. People who were modern architects who did not design a thing that was either steel and glass protested against the demolition of this building. That's how important it was. At the end, it went down. That's where Madison Square Garden sits now. And the train station underneath, if you've ever been to Amtrak in New York City, you come in like underneath. It's a great architecture critic. Now, if you notice, you step down from the street level into here, that's why you go down to the lower level. However, at the time, you had this amazing ceiling above you. Um, was it Mumford who said the great quote about Penn Station? One used to enter the city like a god, one, one scurries in like a rat. I <laughs> 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 love people with a great turn of phrase. Really wonderful. And it's true. This building, the loss of this building, made people realize that if this can go down, anything can go down. So a lot of stuff happened. Books were written. Uh, people lobbied, wrote letters, and finally what happened in 1966 was the passage of the National Historic Preservation Act. Thank you, old LBJ. He signed it. This was not out of place. There were the Clean Air Acts, the Clean Water Acts, all sort of things going on at the time that realized we needed to take care of our environment. This was one of them. The environment also went to built environment. It required that every state have a state historic preservation office, so I have a job directly related to that. It created the National Register of Historic Places, talk a little bit about that in a moment. It also created what we call Section 106, Federal Project Review, that says if you're a federal agency and you are funding, permitting, or licensing an activity, and you bump into a building that is 50 years old or older, or you're doing ground disturbance, you gotta stop and go, what is this gonna do? Is this gonna harm historic resources? Is it gonna enhance historic resources? So that's the review process for our office. It's the same thing with clean air and clean water. What are you doing and how it will affect the community and the environment, including the built environment? 
We see on the section 106 right now between 8 and 12,000 reviews a year. We're very tired. We're very, very busy. The offices, the shippos, this is actually where I work on an island where the Mohawk and the Hudson come together. Got a waterfall on one side, but I can't, my office will look at it, so come see it. Um, we oversee all the state and federal preservation programs. Now, like I said, I run seven, and there are like five more in the office. It just keeps expanding and expanding and expanding and expanding because we find needs we have to fill with these programs. National Register. Most people, most people may have heard of the National Register, but I'm not sure what it is and isn't. The National Register is the nation's official list of objects, buildings, sites, structures, landscapes, even boats that are important at local, state, and national history. It's not only up here. It's called the National Register, but the National Register recognizes things all the way important down at the local level. You have an historic district here, the Four Corners Historic District, established in 1976. It includes the church and the parsonage and the, old, and the parish hall. It includes the building on the corner there. What is the building on that corner? The Old Town Hall. The Old Town Hall, the Oddfellows Building, and a couple of others around. Now, I pulled it for this trip, and I'm like, this is outdated and so tiny. We're talking, we're plotting earlier about looking to see we can, how many more buildings we can put on the National Register, because your benefits to being on the National Register. Now, again, the building has to be at least 50 years old. That is always rolling forward. So a project done in 1976, like the Stafford Four Corners District, didn't look anything after 1926. We always have to roll that date forward and go, what has acquired significance in the time? Again, we have criteria for what's historic. Are you architecturally important? Are you historically important? Are you associated with an important event, associated with an important person? Are you a work of a master architect? Are you the rare survivor of a type? And then, of course, there are criteria after that also for integrity, meaning if we look at it, can we understand it as a historic building? Or has it been so mutilated by time? We don't understand it anymore. You look at those criteria. We are the leading uh, state in the nation on National Register listings. We have the most, and we always put the most every year online. And it's an honorific. The great myth about the National Register is it puts a protection on the building. It does not. It's an honorific. It recognizes that building, that district, that object, anything else as important, again, to local, state, and national history. And it brings the benefits as a form of grants for not-for-profit municipalities, like churches and town halls that are listed on the National Register also brings tax credits to the federal and state level to incentivize investment in the historic buildings. We also have a residential credit for, net, for homeowners whose buildings are listed in the National Register. These are things we provide to incentivize the care and investment in these historic resources. But again, if anybody tells you, National Register, don't put my building in the National Register, don't tell me what to do, that's not true. You can list your building in the National Register on Thursday and tear it down on Friday if you're not using any federal money. It's just an honorific. So keep that in mind. That's one thing we always hear. You don't do that. Don't tell me we don't in the register. Okay, you're giving out money, basically. So I'm going to go through a couple of building types. This is Pittsford, a very wonderful Erie Canal village. The entire village is on the National Register. Their houses, the commercial district, even the old industrial buildings on the canal. This building, as well as others, have used federal and state tax incentives to rehabilitate themselves to keep them so active and used today. Lighthouses. The Eastern Hudson River has a whole series of historic lighthouses. Remember, it's an estuary, so ocean going boats go all the way to Albany, and you were doing it in the 19th century, so there are lighthouses up and, down, up and down the river. This one is automated, of course, now, as they all are, but the people used to live there and man that light. What's cool about this building is it's now a bed and breakfast. You can stay there. It's certain high tide, you have to get there by boat. There's a little marshy walkway if you go in low tide, you may make sure you go and come and go when you need to, otherwise you're stuck there. But it sits out in the river, out from the uh, west shore of the Hudson, and it's a great place to go. And we gave money through grants because it's listed for that, uh, the light on top. We, had it we helped uh, fund its removal, total restoration, and put back. And it still works, it's just not the main light for the river now. We even look at engineering structures. Structures is one of the criteria. Engineering structures, such as bridges and highways, things like that. Uh, these truss bridges, particularly on the Erie Canal, are very important to the character of New York State. We have so many of them because of the canal. And every time, every, every 15 or 20 years, we're trying another one. Let's try this, let's try that. Let's try this design, let's try this type. So we have a whole history of bridge building in New York State, way back into the early 19th century on to the mid 20th century. And we've identified them for the engineering significance. There's even a steam shovel in 
You surprised me. I didn't know this was this, where this was earlier. You said it's over in Leroy? This is Leroy. Yeah. Um, so when you think of the National Register, you may think of a house, you may think of a church, you may think of an entire collection of buildings, but don't forget, we even look at objects. This is considered an object under the rules. Um, this is an enormous thing. It has two, two, steam engine, two steam engines, one for the tractors and one for the, for the, um, the shovel. These were built by the hundreds and shipped to Panama to dig the Panama, to Panama, Panama Canal. There's too many N's and M's in there. Panama Canal. This one is almost documented as having been brought back. Because they finished digging the canal, a lot of them were brought to America and to everywhere else. You, you bought them, they were still usable. So this one is a rare surviving type of a double steam engine steam shovel. So we've listed on the National Register. I always remind people history didn't stop in 1895 or 1905. This is a very important example of a prefab house built after World War II as an early attempt to house the returning soldiers. It's called a Lustron house. It's enameled steel. A man uh, leased an abandoned or an empty uh, wartime factory, steel factory, that had porcelain, porcelainizing equipment and decided to do this. They came on flatbeds, you put them on a slab. These are panels here. These are uh, porcelainized roof tiles, metal windows, a uh, cute little decoration there. Interior was metal too, metal ceilings, metal walls. They had a radiant heat from the ceiling, they had built-in heating, built-in washer and dryer, built-in kitchen equipment, built-in furniture. You had that in your picture with the magnets. You did, one of the weird little quirks. Um, it was basically like a kit home. They delivered and put it up on a slab. Uh, they sold well. Uh, there's some history, a little bit of controversy what happened. Some people say the home builders using timber said they didn't like it, so they undermined it and got the grants were strong from the federal government. We have these scattered all over the United States. We have an entire street in Albany full of them. This one's in Latham, north of Albany. Now, you said, do you know any of this area, Cynthia? I think there might be one in Syracuse. I've absolutely never seen anything in the Rochester, Genesee Valley, Buffalo area. That doesn't mean they don't exist, but um, no one's ever mentioned them. And so well, it's more in the eastern part of the state. Do you want to start a scavenger hunt? <laughs> right here today. Go find one. Yeah. You'll and find some. in rural areas. I saw one, and I think it was um, Saranac Lake, because these mm -hmm. were kit houses. Yeah. They could send them anywhere the railroad. Went. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I've seen them as, mm -hmm. as guest houses behind uh, big houses in Mississippi. I've seen them as farm offices in Louisiana. Um, they're pretty much, they're not uncommon. But they're not, or they're still have to be rare, but they're such a rare example of a prefab home built for the post war effort that we can show the significant. Now, if you look at the form and the windows, sometimes oddly enough people cover them with vinyl siding. I'm not sure why. But if you know the form of the building or look for the rooftop, you go, ah, there's one under there. So keep your eyes peeled. We even come pretty far up to date. This is the uh, TWA terminal, the former TWA terminal, built at JFK Airport at the time it was in Idlewild, designed by Eero Saarinen, a very important Finnish-American architect, who also did the Kleinhans Music Hall in Buffalo in the 40s, 30s and 40s. This was built, finally finished in 1962. It's younger than I am. So it's listed on the National Register. I'll tell you why. Eero Saarinen was a master architect amazing architect and engineer. This actually soars over, this is a shell of concrete that soars over here and there's nothing but glass under here on trusses. It's like being under the wings of a bird. Also, it was the first terminal built for jet aircraft. Everything before was a retrofitted for props. This one, you walked in and you walked up to the level of the jet, you came through a tube here, that's totally enclosed, no windows. You leave here, this big glassy area, you go up a tube to appear to board your planes. What Saren wanted you to feel like is the minute you walked in the building, you were in air, you were flying. And walking up that ramp, and you're above the tarmac where the planes are, he wanted you to feel like the minute you stepped in, you were in the jet age. And it still is to today. Now, it's no longer used as an airplane terminal because it's too small and outdated for security issues. But we have worked very carefully. Uh, JetBlue now has a terminal behind it, there are hotels on either side of it, and it's now the lobby of the hotel, convention space, and event space, and being fully restored right now. The opening is a TWA hotel. All the people, all the hosts, and the uh, people at the desk, and all the staff will wear 1960s TWA uniforms. It's a little weird. 
security here. And the rooms are like out of Madden. Even the phones, which are actually touch tone, look like rotary phones. It's actually, it's, they, they're really selling this. They're selling this 1960s thing with this building. It's pretty cool. I won't be able to afford to stay there. <laughs> but we look at things even to the modern age. This one was less than 50 years old. We started looking at it because it was under threat from development at JFK. And also we realized Aeroceranin is nobody you just ignore. It's a master architect. The engineering is significant. The fact that it was the first jet terminal built in the world for jet traffic really is way up high. I mentioned 106, that section, Federal Review. We also have one in New York State called Section 1409, impacted, uh, impact, uh, passed in 1980. As federal agencies have to take into effect the impacts or effects of their undertakings, state agencies have to do the same. In other words, a state agency or federal agency, when they undertake a project, again, funding permits or licenses, if they bump into something 50 years or older, and they don't know anything about it, they have to ask us. If we say, yeah, we care about that. They have to consult with us to make sure their actions do not harm those historic resources. We look to avoid the impact, minimize them, or if we can't avoid or minimize, we mitigate them. We're trying to make sure those historic resources are kept first and foremost in those reviews. That's highway widenings, anything else. I've got a couple of examples for you. Julian, before I leave that slide, yes. so you mentioned just briefly the photograph of this particular resource that you've got. It's my dog. <laughs> no, no. Well, that's people think of you know churches and houses. Yes, and this stores. is this. Who knows what this dog looks? Who knows this dog? What? Nipper, Nipper, the RCA mascot, RCA Records. His master's voice. You know, he was listening to the to the bell of the gramophone. It was so realistic, like his master. He thought he was listening to his master's voice. Nipper was the symbol of the RP, RCA Records. This was built as a warehouse for RCA Records in the 1930s. And Nipper, he's quite large. He's like 25 feet tall or so. He was built for the building, fabricated in Albany for RCA. He's still like that, still like that. And you know, people go to Nipper and take a left. And people go. He's on the National Register. Building is on the National Register. It's a subject of rehabilitation right now, using the tax credits. But people go go to what? Every city has one. I had a, a cousin who lived in Atlanta, and he had moved to a suburb, and he said, go to the big chicken and take a look. I said, go to the what? And there was a Kentucky Fried Chicken building from the 1960s that looked like a big chicken. And I said, oh, that's, well, you can't miss that direction. You see the big chicken, you take a left. You go to Nip Nipper, you take a left. There's actually a local blog in Albany in a part of town called Nipper Town. So it's really cool. It's one of those odd little things. People don't realize that every city has something like this. So, and I just take it by granted, I go by it all the time. So, you can see it from 787 on the highway up in Albany. We look at everything like road widenings, bridge work, expressways. Um, DOT is not always our friend, um, but they have to take in consideration what they're doing. And this is the Taconic State Parkway. If you know the Taconic Parkway, it runs from New York City on the east side of the river all the way up into Columbia County across from Albany. Designed as a parkway, a pleasant way to access the series of parks that FDR and his uh, successors were placing along that part of the river. Also, it was an easy way to get home with a nice drive. So, it is a parkway in that you are felt to me like you're going through a park. It's green, it's leafy, there's a green median. And this is a timber rail. There's plenty of space here. There's no railing here, it's just what's called a mountable curb that you can, if you veer on, it directs you back onto the highway. It's also scallops to reflect light without lots of metal. The bridges date from all periods, but even the old newest ones are clad with stone because it looks like you're going through a lovely park. Now, the closer you get to New York City, they're going through a lovely park at 85 miles an hour, but it's still a pleasant drive for most of this, uh, most of this trip. You go through the backs of farms, rolling hills, this beautiful, pleasant drive all the way up the Hudson. Um, DOT is always looking to turn this into an interstate. We're going to put more lanes in, we're going to have metal railings in. Now they want to take the stone off the bridges. Why? It might fall. Is it falling? No, but it might fall. We'll put it back on. <laughs> so we're actually meeting with them next week to try to keep them from taking the stone off the bridges. DOT has a mission. Boy, do they act like they have a mission. It, we are always struggling with a lot of these state and federal agencies. They go, remember, 
you have characters for a character to maintain in your projects as well as anything else. We try to find the balancing act of what they're trying to do and what we need them to do. It's not always easy. And for those of you who are in Western New York, while well, Julian's showing you the Taconic Parkway, you have the Lake Ontario Parkway that goes to Hamlin Beach and beyond. It's the same era and design plan as what you just saw at the Taconic Parkway. You know, there are no 18-wheeler no. trucks. It's very like that, that was to be a scenic parkway, not a highway. Yeah, exactly. We look at things even like, um, this is a, hy a hydropower plant on the Hudson, north of Albany, a very early one. Uh, Edison used some of these to explore his hydropower theories. Um, this is in the National Register. When it comes up for renewal by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, we have to make sure they're not basically screwing it up. We want to make sure it runs efficiently, has the most modern equipment in it, but at the same time, they shouldn't put three stories on a satellite dish on top. Because it is also a very important reminder of the early of the hydropower in New York State. <coughs> we do a lot of housing projects. Our bread and butter are housing projects. Turning old schools into senior housing or affordable housing or even market rate housing. Doing a lot of housing projects across New York State. Newburgh, New York, uh, where I mentioned where the Hasbro House, George Washington's headquarters was, was built up beautifully. It was the home of tastemakers in America. <coughs> People who designed buildings and parks and wrote books to influence design throughout the 19th century tried their stuff out in Newburgh first. It was an amazing hotbed of design and design theory at the time. Um, this is a building, before and after. Newburgh's hit hard skids in the 1980s and 90s. We're seeing a lot of investment, not only by the state and the feds, also private developers right now in Newburgh, which is doing very well. They're bringing the city back building by building by block by block. This building went through federal funding, and we reviewed it. We made sure several things happened. This whole point bracket and bracket issue. Hudson River bracketed is kind of a sub uh, subtitle, <coughs> sub style of architecture you find in Newburgh. Very, very, a lot, a lot of it. Any other developer or any other person trying to make a cheap rehab might have chopped that gable off, ripped off the brackets and vinyl sided it. We stepped in. We don't add money to the project. We don't stop projects. In fact, sometimes preservation is cost effective because you're not adding things. You're not keeping what's there in many regards and repairing it. This is now uh, two units, two duplexes, two floors and two floors, modern appliances, modern kitchens, modern bathrooms, energy efficient windows, insulated walls, but at the same time, when you get out of the street in Newburgh, that city is retaining its very important 19th century character. They're not turning it to a plastic suburb. So we work with that all the time in Newburgh. I want to talk one more thing. I know we're getting close on time here. I always say flexible. There's more. I want to stay in line. I'll talk, but we'll do this. Um, there's a program started in 1980 by the federal government called the Certified Local Government Program. Now, 1980 is an important date. Now, what if we lost Penn Station in New York City, what else is left? Grand Central, right? Grand Central Terminal, not station, because it's where trains stop and originate. It's a terminal. You go through a station, you stop at a terminal. People always correct you that. Grand Central Terminal. It was built as the second Grand Train Station in New York City. Amazing space. Have you been there recently or not? Well, we worked on rehab of it in the early 90s because it was looking a little shabby. It's amazing, beautiful, absolutely beautiful. Repurposed, they use areas that were used as much anymore for food courts or shops. There's a food hall like you'd see in England. It's a wonderful destination place as well as a train station today. Um, now, we lost Penn Station. New York City put ordinance in place very early and designated Grand Central. Protected. Well, Grand Central, by the, by the 1970s, people are going, hmm, how can we make some more money out of this? It's in Midtown, it's in Park Avenue. You know what? This is a big open space. We'll put some floors in it, put some offices in it, build a 50-story tower on top. And the city's excuse us, that's, you got to talk to us. What do you mean you got to talk to us? It's a designated building. You to, no, 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 that, that's, we don't have to talk to you. That's unconstitutional. It's our building. We do what we want. And the city said, we recognize it's important to the life of New York City. The character of New York City, the culture of New York City, and transportation. you got to talk to us. They said, we'll see you in court. Went all the way to the Supreme Court. In 1978, the Supreme Court looked at the case and said, you know what? You're doing fine here. You're making money. Making, not making enough money for all to retire to the moon, apparently, what you want to do, but you're making money. It's a viable project. 
Nobody's holding you back from any property center around here. And this landmark allows of health. Just like we were talking earlier, there's everything you do in a municipality, you have to go get a permit for. You're not free and willing to do exactly my home is my castle, as long as you get all the permits to build the castle, which you may not be able to get. We live in a community. We share responsibility. We, what we do at our properties impacts other properties, or values, and quality of life. That was happening in Grand Central. In 78, when the Supreme Court said, this law is upheld, this is constitutional. Now, people have been acting on faith since 1930, remember? <laughs> so for 48 years, they've been stepping out on ice. In 78, it was all vindicated. So everybody suddenly wanted a landmark law. I want one, I want one. And of course, people are trying to reinvent the wheel, and the federal government, the National Park Service, as what I call the mothership historic preservation said, uh, uh, we've been doing this a while, we know what we're doing. So they put together the Certified Local Government Program in 1980 that said, if you want that little ordinance, we can help you. Our state developed a model law that we know is defensible in court and does the job. If you adopt that law and go by the requirements of it and enter an agreement with our office, you can become what we call a CLG. We help the local commissions with advice, technical advice, Legal advice, design advice, we're there if they need us by their side, because people are sometimes it's a touchy thing. It's a really, really touchy thing um, to be pleasing our neighbors. It really is. So we're there to help and make sure the program stays running. And also, if you're a CLG, there's a grant program that's only available to those communities. I just got in my email uh, after dinner the list of this year's or permitted awards for the CLG program. So I've got to go back and look over that hotel room and see if I can sign off on it. Um, it really is a very good program. We have over 70 in New York State. Um, I always say there's hot beds. There's a ton around the <coughs> the road. There's quite a collection out of Rochester, or a collection around Syracuse, um, around up into the Hudson Valley, Long Island. New York City is a CLG. I call it the 800 pound gorilla of CLGs. Because I have everything from the town, a uh, little village of Fayetteville, right outside of Syracuse, to Fairport, outside of Rochester, to Albany, Syracuse. Brockport. Brockport, even New Buffalo is one, Syracuse, the big ones are, but it goes all the way down to small hamlets and villages and towns. People around New York State are concerned about their environment and their historic resources, and they should be, because they can go overnight. When Home Depot's and Lowe's started going across the United States, what used to take several weeks of planning and construction now happened in a weekend. A porch could be ripped off. Third floor could go on. It was amazing what the do-it-yourself centers Scared, scared people. Because you can have a resource that really could change in a weekend, or be lost in a weekend, or demolition in a weekend. So we've seen this enormous growth the certified local government program in New York State because people care about where they live. They want to live somewhere that has character, and that character is embodied in historic resources and historic buildings. I always tell people, you have history books? You have anything else, family histories? These buildings are your history books. It's wood, brick, and stone. They are your family Bibles, so the history of your family, history of your community. They are history, standing right there in 380 before you. If you lose it, you've lost a huge library of information. <clears throat> a lot of people forget what's been lost. We have short memories. When I was in grad school at University of Georgia in 83 to 86, I have to remember, it's been a while back, um, Athens, Georgia, was built around the university. The university was founded in 1783. The town grew up around it. It's federal era houses from the 18 teens and 20s. Amazing Greek revival resources, great Victorian resources, great 20th century resources. They looked to put a preservation ordinance in place in 83. People went wild. Well, we've got great stuff. We don't need any protection. We've been doing this fine on our own. Look, we've got all this stuff. People very sadly put out a big spread of the local newspaper called The Tour You'll Never Take. It listed and photographed all the buildings that were lost. Not in 1920, not in 1940, not in 1970s and 1980s. These amazing structures that people just forgot. Beautiful theaters, beautiful homes, uh, beautiful churches that were demolished in their memory. But they had to be shown what you've lost. This is what's happened in your time without any kind of local protection. The ordinance passed. Because people, I love what's called the tour you'll never take. And sometimes communities have to understand what they've lost when they finally say, no more. We need to hold the line right here because what's going to happen if we lose everything that is about our community, our buildings, our houses, our four corners? So 
I'm going to leave it at that. That's kind of a call of action, I think. If, I'm going to the Baptist church. That's kind of an altar call, I think, right now. So, but nobody has to walk me out. It's okay. Julian, you showed that one picture of the house before. Oh, my goodness. Let me find that one. Horrible rehab after. Well, you mean this one? Yes. <laughs> we practice this, apparently. Um, the little village of Phoenix. Phoenix is Shrupal. It's a town, one's a town, one's a village. They're kind of in a bubble. They're together outside of Syracuse. And I'll use your name because they need to be shamed. Um, this was a very early building. When you come up from Syracuse into this village, this is the first building you'd see on your right, where you've got the little town center, the little village center. It's a great record of the growth because this is a pretty early settlement, early settlement period. If you look at the eaves up here, it possibly was a federal era house, 1810 to 1825 or so. You got an addition on the rear. This is great here. This is a porch that at first glance looked Greek Revival, but those are octagonal columns, which are, or, or are of the Romanesque Revival period. So sometime in the mid 19th century, somebody went and looked at a very sophisticated catalog, or got a designer, or a carpenter, and put a very up-to-date front on it. So this represented, at the time of this construction, quite a few long history of this house. It's set there as a great welcome to Phoenix, welcome to Shrupal building. They had a local ordinance. A new mayor rescinded it. Said, we don't need that. Why do we need that? Now, this was bought by a couple, and they were going to rehab it. This is where they went with it. <laughs> the real tragedy was they got into a fight, got divorced, left the house like this. <coughs> so when you had this, that in the course of the summer, it came back. You'll drive by this house and go, when the heck was that thing built? That's ugly. That's why you need community involvement about what the future of the community is going to be. You can't rest on one person. You can't rely on two people. It relies on the citizens of the community acting through your local government to say, this is important to us. We need to have a voice in this. I think that's an important thing to do. And I really... That said, thank you for your time. It's a little after 8 o'clock. I take a few questions if you want. But I'm hungry. I'm hungry. <laughs> <laughs> so come you hungry. No, no, come on. I, no, I'll be fine. Come on. Do we have some questions? Oh, I'll take you in front of it. <clears throat> uh, it's commendable that in our relatively young country, mm -hmm. historic preservation is taken seriously. Uh, what is the situation like in countries like China, India and Egypt, whose cultural heritage goes back thousands of years with respect to historic preservation. China's bulldozing everything. They're historic neighborhoods because they're embarrassed. They're, you know, oh. China is actually picking very cherry picking historic areas and overdoing them, over restoring the things they never were, while demolishing the most historic and important parts of their cities. This horror is happening in China. I'm not sure if what's happening in India a lot. Egypt, ancient Egypt, you know, they, they live and sell on that. Mm -hmm. One thing I did here several years back was an architect friend of mine in New York City was hosting somebody from Eastern Europe. And he said, he <clears throat> works in preservation planning in Eastern Europe. You work in preservation planning in the United States. What's that lunch? We described our program. And one thing he said, which struck me very interestingly, this also happens in South America, which has much more European history um, from you know, time to kings and everything else. You know, there were kingships and uh, colonies much longer in South America, and also the Spanish model, which didn't have get rid of the king until the 1930s. And we got rid of it pretty early of English law, but we started, they started reigning in the king in the 1200s from the Magna Carta in England. So he said the thing that impressed him, and this goes all the way back to even any writings of the 19th century, is in America, preservation starts here. We want this. So we're going to put together a committee, we're going to form a law, we're going to make this happen. He said, in his world, in his history, in his lifetime, the leader said, we're going to preserve this. Okay. They chose what to preserve. And he went, okay, you're the boss. Which means you only get what they want to preserve, or what they think is important or think is pretty. And what they don't, doesn't fit sometimes their political agenda, gets kicked out. He said the thing in America that impressed him was it was here. It came from the bottom up. And we like that. That's why we have this local program in right. effect saying like exactly. we want we want this. We want this effort. <coughs> and we can sit in our office all day long and then we wouldn't have no work to do but what people like you were concerned. Sorry. I want you next talking. Okay.
Uh, I may be incorrect in what I recall, but it seems to me that in New York State, the CLG community, you had to have an ordinance. Yes, you did. That re <coughs> that uh, allowed the uh, local government to mandate a landmark designation, even if the homeowner objected. Now, is that correct? That is true, but it is. He said, a, a CLG or the local ordinance in New York State, our model ordinance, has a process where a designation happens from a select team, a committee of experts and interested people using criteria to designate a property. The homeowner says, I don't want it designated. Sorry, it meets the criteria. I use this example. In the town of Clarence, out of Buffalo, a developer kept wanting to build on a wetland. Why? It was cheap land. Houses would have flooded in two years. Corps of Engineers steps in and said, that's a wetland. I don't think it's a wetland. Here's the criteria. It's a wetland. These are the regulations and the criteria for makes a wetland. I don't care what you think. You are not building here. Well, same thing. We have criteria for what the resources are. And the, if it meets those criteria, the owner's opinion, I don't think it's historic, it's not a criteria. The reason I'm bringing this up, Sharon, help me out on this. I think we discussed this in Batavia. And the city government resisted it because they said if a homeowner doesn't want it, that's their business. You know what I say to that? Is that, is that what you're I'm not sure that was the exact reason. There was a couple of things in our ordinance that didn't quite meet the criteria. Oh, the owner objection is key for us because then it becomes advisory and has no power. Because I, we have designated properties that people objected to. Good. Yeah. I say it's like this the fire marshal comes in your house and goes, okay. that water is not the code. I think it does. It has something more to do with uh, the historic districting part of our code. I don't remember. You have to look at the it's conversation. It's, yeah. Okay. But Fair really, enough. didn't we run into that with the lay mansion? Well, that's that's they sued us. Yeah. That was that's whole, never a good sign. That was a whole different thing. They they claimed they were a state agency, but they were also a 501c3, and uh, so they took it to the local county court, and we of course lost. I think if we had taken it to the appeals court. Oh, that's what you're mentioning, but yes. the city didn't want us to pay to do that, so, so we had to rescind the designation. Well, but remember that. It was the question, are you a state agency or are right. you a 501c3? Right. Yeah. Okay. Are you, or what are you? What are Choose you one. Yeah. The key with putting preservation in an ordinance local level, it has the power of local law. Again, you don't get to argue with the code official about, I don't think it's a commercial use. Well, you're not zone commercial. Well, I don't think it's more, you know, I don't think that, I think that wiring is a code. You know, it really is local government. The community has boxy standards. There are solid criteria for what is and isn't historic. The case is made through the designation process. An owner is temporary. Frankly, an owner is temporary. If you want that resource to be part of your community in the future, you have to take that action. And it's really important to know, because I'll cite a local case that we had 20 years ago. Even though in the local ordinance you can designate over an owner's objection, that part of the law is not used frequently. That is really a last ditch effort. You need to be upfront and educating your owners and yeah. your community what the value is of this and say that, you know, really, some people think that if you get on the National Register of Historic Places, it protects the building from demolition or from the back end being ripped off. And the National Register does not control private owners and how they use their private money. They can still, we can go on a bus tour and see open, um, empty lots, a whole day of empty lots where there used to be National Register buildings because a private owner tore them down. There was nothing to protect them. That is the critical difference between having a village, town, or preservation ordinance like you have in Batavia, where you have, as we call it, teeth to protect and have a review before something is terribly altered or torn down. The landmarks, or Rochester, New York, has had a city preservation ordinance since 1968. I think we were the third community in New York State right. to have it. We have an ordinance that we can designate a property over an owner's objection, but that rarely gets into play because we work ahead of time mm -hmm. with convincing the owners of its importance. Have we used that? Of course we have. Former Holy Redeemer Catholic Church at the corner of Hudson and Clifford was going to become a vacant lot because the church had been sold or was about to be sold. And the thought from the diocese was it would be more marketable if that was just a piece of land with grass on it. And we, that went to the appeals process and it was overruled. The owner's objection was 
we had to have a meeting of both the Planning Commission and the Zoning Commission. I think it had to have a super majority, seven out of nine, of both voting to designate. So that was one of the rare, rare times the City of Rochester designated a building over an owner's objection, but it has a higher threshold of review to get there. But again, we don't use it that often, but it is there in in case, when it's critical. I always tell people education is the key. Tell them what it means and doesn't mean. Typically, ordinance deal with the front of the building seen from the public right away. It doesn't affect the use of the building. It doesn't affect what happens inside the building. Sometimes it doesn't affect what happens in your backyard. It's what is presentable to the public. The public shared public face of that building, you know, is important. So it's it's not like you can't do anything in your house. It's just the design review process to go through it. There's good criteria that are upfront and known. It's not a mystery. Nobody makes our finger should be yellow. No, there's criteria for what you do and don't do. Paint colors, I don't give a whip about. I don't care about paint colors. But you can educate people all day long and they'll just say, I don't want to tell you. That's why that's important. But you say to them, you already do get told what to do because there's so many. You can say that to me, but they still they call Oh, yeah. Me. I understand. You're not going to tell me what to do. I mean, One of the things you have to understand is this is zoning. If you live in a community that has zoning, the next question we always ask, how is that zoning applied? Strictly, moderately, or loosely? And we get chuckles and we know what they're going to say. If it's applied loosely, suddenly having a preservation ordinance as part of your zoning is not going to make your life no. beautifully regulated and everything is going to be perfect. So there's, you know, this is not a simple process, but it is, you already have zoning with rare exceptions like the town of Angelica um, does not have zoning, but they have something else they just don't call it zoning. So you already have where people say, nobody tells me what to do with my property. There is zoning in place, and maybe your zoning isn't enforced real strong. Well, I can go to like electrical permits and water permits and building permits are all there for the protection of the community. This is one another step. But they don't want more. You know what I'm saying? Right. Yeah. I understand that. Like, but the, as we say, it's created by humans, and even a preservation code isn't perfect, but it's another tool that you have available. And there is an appeals process, even if he does yeah, sure. They can still go to city council on appeal. Right. Yeah. The key with this is that studies have been done that show that districts, historic neighborhoods, or designation, keep their value or yes. gain value quicker because yeah. people can invest in there knowing that what's happening is not going to hurt their investment in their building. People. And we had, I don't know, talking about her presentation years ago. And woman said, my sister lived in the historic district of Saratoga. She got out of there because she we told her, I said, well, she probably got a hell of good money for it because people buy into those neighborhoods because they want to be where the character is and they know that character is protected. I said, she probably laughed all, she probably cried all the way to the bank, you know, felt proud of it, but then she was just like, come on, think about this. So anyway. You're talking philosophy, you know. Hmm? You're talking philosophy. You're talking architectural mm -hmm. philosophy. Oh. You're talking checking the whole schmeal of how I interact with other people. Yeah, exactly. Our face. You had a question, sir? Yeah, I think I remember what it was. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> 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 oh. Ask another one. Come on. It has something to do with catheters. I'm not sure. <laughs> how do you think I told you so long? <laughs> Yes. Well, in, if you know, in the early 70s, the powers that be decided that all those wonderful buildings on Main Street uh -huh. had to go. Uh -huh. And uh, they decided that the best thing would be to build a huge shopping mall in the southern town. Yeah. Yeah. And then about two years later, the powers that be nationally decided that all these big box stores were located on the edge of town. Right. Anyway, but people don't realize that that mall is the only example of Stalinist Maoist architecture. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm wondering if in another five years it would qualify because it would be 50 years I'll later. tell you what's happening. This is an actual real life example. I live in Troy, New York, wonderful Victorian downtown. What we don't realize is one third of downtown was lost urban renewal. However, it was a swath, so people never knew it was there, people who didn't live through it. However, there was a proposal to take the rest of downtown down and build these big boxes. One of them was the first of the downtown mall. They put a parking garage, they tore down two beautiful blocks of buildings for parking garage and an enclosed mall with a glass you made center, center and yeah. brick areas. Movie theater, shopping center that lasted three years. Went away. It's now the home of farmer's market, and the owner is looking to redo it because it's time to refresh it. 
It's the only piece of the urban renewal plan in Troy that got built. We did a reevaluation of the downtown Troy historic district, added over 300 new buildings because it was such an old district. We said, well, these buildings are historic and the boundary went up this way. Investments flooding in because of the incentives we provided in those programs. My national register coordinator works for me, loves modern architecture, and is an urban renewal historian. She put the downtown Troy Mall in the parking garage in the National Register. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, I can't argue with the philosophy, but I gotta hate this. <laughs> we do have, we're looking at the, the Empire State Plaza in Albany, tore down 70 city blocks. Some of the oldest buildings in North America went to the landfill. Albany 1630s. They had buildings from the 1680s and 1690s that went in the landfill behind the, because of that project. However, we now look at the Empire State Plaza as an important artifact of that period of downtown mega projects, and we consider contributing to the National Register. And uh, well, Bob Inger, who Cynthia knew, worked at our office for years, and he said, I know it's time to get out of the field from the preserving things I got in the field to get rid of. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting there. As you all drive around your communities and wonder what Julian and I do when we look at buildings, whether they're in a rural area or an urban area, we never use these two phrases when we're discussing them with each other. Gee, is that pretty? Or God, is that ugly? <laughs> because that really does not explain what that, that thing, building, structure, object, or site, what does that, the real question is, what does this particular property or group of properties tell you about that village, that crossroads, that downtown, that neighborhood. That is what we are talking about. We have, there's a very specific, we don't do this willy-nilly. We, we would be telling you the same information any of the 50 states. If we were in Utah, Washington, Texas, these are all criteria that come from the National Park Service that have been very well thought out and are as objective as they can be. But we're really not looking at this as a beauty contest. It's not, is this the prettiest building, the best cared for? There are many things on the National Register that are, are barely in fair condition, but they still represent and are recognizable for what they are, like say, an abandoned warehouse, an 1890s mill, the factory over in Batavia that's going to be repurposed for something, which is, which is a multi Yes, that's, that's a factory. You mean you go and look at the industrial parts of a community? Yes, that's a big part of a community's history. We're not just cruising the big the house where the big houses are located or the glamorous churches. Well, would you look at in our community? Pardon? Would you look in our community? Oh sure. When I did the presentation last year, I literally drove every road in the town of Stafford looking for buildings that projected every facet of your history, whether they were in great condition or poor condition. I may have stopped on a road and taken a picture of a little concrete bridge culvert from the 1920s, because that was a new installation as the automobile was coming in and horses were going out and roads were becoming modernized. Over in Wheatland, there was a town supervisor who put in some of these concrete bridges and he's got his name embossed on the side of them because he wanted everybody to know he was improving the roads of Wheatland for the new automobile traffic. And who would ever think that that's part of your story along with the churches and the schools and the houses and the barns? And one thing we want to look at was a great quote. This was the professor of architecture at Tulane University around 1972. He made a great quote, what I love, totally appreciate he was. The basic purpose, the basic, you didn't start. The basic purpose of historic preservation is not to freeze time, but to mediate sensibly with the forces of change. Our communities have to grow, our buildings have to change. We want to make sure that we take the best forward with us, and the new ship that comes in is a good neighbor. It has to grow, it has to change. Buildings have different lives. We do a lot of adaptive reuse in our programs, schools to housing, offices to, to apartments. Uh, churches to restaurants. We find new uses for these buildings while making sure the best of them stays. And we want growth in our community. We want growth in our downtown. We want to make sure what happens there is a good neighbor to what always ha already happened. I always say I can walk down the street in most cities or town and go, eh, I mean, you can do this. 1825, 1850, 1865, mm, 1890, mm, 1915, mm, 1945. 
What goes in next? We should go 1945, 19, oh, 2019. We shouldn't go 1945, 19, oh my god, what's that? Because we want to make sure that these buildings are good neighbors. They need to recommend, represent their time. We're not about creating Disneyland. New architecture, okay, old architecture, was new architecture when it first came around. Greek Revival architecture. One of the leading proponents in America was a man named Menard Lefebvre. He wrote the, the guidebooks, these style books for Greek architecture in the 1830s. We now look at these buildings as amazing, beautiful, historic buildings. You know what the title of this book was? The Beauties of Modern Architecture. <laughs> he was designing modern buildings. We want to make sure the buildings we're designing now and putting in neighborhoods can have that kind of, we can look back fondly on them 100 years from now. And preservation is not about living in the past either. It's like Julian and I came here in automobiles. We did not come here in horses and buggies. I have indoor plumbing at my house. It is, Julian said, it's not about living in the past or making your community a museum because then you're usually in trouble because you're not having any economic growth. But it's about moving ahead. But you've talked about all of the options and how this is going to affect it. Not made a knee-jerk decision that a year later you say, why on earth did we ever let that happen? Because it, it is a short, Americans have about a five minute attention span, and it's getting shorter by, by, by the minute. And so we don't think of the future is three weeks from now. It's not like the old days where most people lived in the same house for many years today. Americans change addresses on average every five years. That is not permanent. That's not, I'm gonna build my house and I'll be there and they'll take me out in a casket. So this impermanence is a challenge. And often in communities and neighborhoods, do you know who are the most active proponents of those areas? People who have just moved there and are seeing with fresh eyes what wonderful things are in a community. Often if you've lived in a community for a long time and you've had economic challenges, the best you can do is show up at the coffee shop and complain that things have been crummy since FDR was in office. <laughs> But you have newcomers, and they are moving there because they've picked your community, or they saw something that they didn't know from somewhere else, and they really appreciate it with fresh eyes. So one of the things to do is fill up your tank with gas and go out and drive your neighborhood, your city, the town of Stafford, and pretend you're a tourist. And look at all of the properties and buildings as if you're in a different community and say, gee, that's a really beautiful building. What does that tell me? What is this all about? Isn't this a great vista we have over here? Because it's so different from what you see every day. And even people that live in a community a long time, you all travel the same roads. You never take like that other way. You go from here to here. And I've been in communities where I've worked with people, they've lived there their whole lives. They've only been in one part of the community. When I did a town of Greece survey, we had people that lived up on the lake in the town of Greece. They didn't even know the Erie Canal came through the town of Greece at the south end. They were astonished to discover this, even though they had lived there six or seven decades. So pretend you're a tourist in Stafford or Batavia and take a look differently as if you're the visitor for the first time. And I want, uh, it's 8.30, we're gonna have people get cookies because I've been eating them ahead of you, so sorry about that. Um, you are, you're, this hamlet is formed around a crossroads. Those crossroads were the center of activity. The buildings on these crossroads reflect what was important to this community. Too many communities lose their crossroad buildings to the quickie mart, the stop and shop, whatever. Be careful, because that is a loss that any, you, people will drive right through your community and never know there's anywhere else but any other community that's happened in. It's too There's a famous book called Nowhere USA. <laughs> so you have a very important thing here at this crossroads, this four corners. Treasure and look after it. And that's why I'm guessing this. Thank you.